Gary, good morning. Good morning. Let's start with Manchester City before we get into Arsenal, uh, because let's, oh, yeah, uh, let, let's, let's fill ourselves up with uh, positivity on OTB AM this morning. How good were they last night? Well, they were so good. They, what we normally see, but the standout performer again was Kevin De Bruyne. He was amazing. I mean, I don't, I, I just generally don't think there's a better midfield in the world right now in terms of the level that he's playing at. I think there were times where Arsenal under Arteta would know trying to stifle getting the ball into that central midfield area. Arteta had his front three narrow to encourage City to go wide. But there were times even when he had men around and he passed in the ball, suddenly let the ball run across his body. He drive with that power and pace he has. And in that quality on his pass, Arsenal struggled. But to be perfectly honest, I think most teams would against him. Yeah, for sure. Are you surprised by how quickly De Bruyne looked to be at the pitch required for Premier League? No, not really, because I, I genuinely believe that footballers now are are fit 12 months of the year. Mm. I think they don't take much now to get back. I think gone are the days where you need a long pre-season. I know this is a longer break than most players would ever have, because even in the off-season, more, more often than not, they'll be playing international football. But I just think with the sports scientists, how players look after themselves, no, I'm not, not, not surprised at all, really. Yeah, it looked like everybody across the two games was in really, really good shape. The pace in both games was excellent. I'm not sure is it because we just have a closer affinity to Premier League teams, but it felt like a far more enjoyable evening of football than anything bar, say, Borussia Dortmund versus Bayern Munich has produced in, the, in Spain and Germany over the past month. Yeah, absolutely. We want to see this, you know, this league back. And I felt it was, it, it was a strange scenario because you could listen to the game without um, the, the kind of false crowd noises as such or with it. And I much prefer listening to it with it. I know, I know that it's... It's contrived as such, but it, it didn't feel that different. I think more often than not, you're focusing on the game, not necessarily what's happening in the stadium, but the stadium's atmosphere, of course, is going to be a huge miss. But I think it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, let's go on to Arsenal. What went wrong for them last night? Is, is all the blame on the shoulders of David Luiz primarily here? No, not really. I, I don't think he's fully to blame. Of course, he's cost his team yesterday, but if it wasn't him, it could have been Xhaka. If it wasn't Xhaka, it could have been Ozil. It, it, we're just, they're just reverting to type. It's the same story. And they've got too many players of extremes where on their day, they're good, but when they're bad, they're so bad. And that's the problem that you have is that this isn't just around David Luiz. How he performed last night was no major surprise. It really wasn't. And you've got him, Ozil, Kolasinac, Mustafi, Xhaka, it's the same problem. And as good as Arteta um, looks like he potentially can be as a coach in terms of organising them, which I think he has done, I, I think it's been very noticeable the difference he has made in terms of trying to make him compact. But these players will revert to type. And you, you, it's frustrating because in this long layoff, you want to come back and be positive again, but, but you just can't ignore the fact that they will just continually make the same mistakes. And everyone talks about Mustafi in terms of the, the, the errors that he made leading to that first goal. But even Mustafi, I'm looking at that situation and we talked about Kevin De Bruyne. As soon as Kevin De Bruyne gets that ball in that wide right position, I don't care where he is or how far out he is, as a centre-half, you've got to think we're in trouble here because he has got such ability to whip those balls in. But if you watch Mustafi's role, at no stage does he look over his right shoulder to see if there's a run coming. He's square on, totally oblivious to the fact that Sterling is coming in. Now, the ball in isn't particularly good or certainly by the high standards of Kevin De Bruyne. But nevertheless, if it was, Sterling would have had a, a free attempt on goal. So this is the problem that Arteta is working with. That as much as he tries to coach these bad errors out of them, they will continue to rear their ugly head. So, it Gary, was, sorry, go on, Will. Yeah, I was just going to say, Gary, as much as, like, obviously the focus goes on the error that David Luiz has made, yeah. there was a feeling that that goal was coming because City had oh, got yeah. in behind two or three times in the five or seven minutes before the goal. It was just a case of Arsenal trying to hang on towards half-time. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what's so frustrating as a coach is that you're thinking, listen, we are literally hanging on here. There's a minute to go. Well, eff effectively, there was 15 seconds to go before that error. And you're thinking, that's when you set a half, just have to be safe and, and be reliable. And, and then they're just not. And But for the goalkeeper, Leno, you know, um, City would have been free up at that stage anyway. And, and that's not... That's not necessarily a criticism of Arsenal because City can do that to any team in the world. And that's the quality with which they're playing with. But you just, that mistakes, the mistakes that we saw last night are just mistakes that you see continually and we have done for years. Even on that third goal, if you look back, and I'm, 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 
I'm reluctant to say about Mustafi because I think he's got great character, keeps coming back, makes mistakes, keeps coming back and, 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 and trying his best as such. But even on that third goal, they're retreating as a defence. He's pointing to his teammates, telling them where to go. But effectively, it's his man, Aguero, who receives the ball to get the strike on goal after he falls over. And I know it's Foden then taps it in after it comes off the post, but you just it's such a difficult situation. I was listening to Brian just previously, and he's saying, listen, they really need Chambers to come back. This is a guy, Chambers, who Arsenal discarded, mm. went on loan to Fulham, and they didn't even play in the centre-half. They played him in midfield because you can't trust him at the back. So are Arsenal really relying on him? That's incredible. I, I, I want to see Saliba's coming in terms of them buying him from the French League last season and loaning him back. He's very young. I think Holden is probably the one that I'd like to see come back. But there's massive problems there. Arsenal are not going to have the financial muscle to go out and, and, and buy a ready-made centre-half. So they're going to have to be creative. They're going to have to try and create one within their group. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that the likes of Mustafi, Luis, Socrates, there's not one there. How did Antonio Conte get a Premier League winning defender out of David Luiz? Well, listen, I, I, and I've said this to you so many times, and I've said in commentary of Arsenal, David Luiz has incredible attributes. Mm. He, he genuinely does. In terms of his physicality, his ability on the ball, he's a strong man, he's powerful. But ultimately, what you do with someone like David Luiz and what Conte done is that you just negate the space that he works in. You condense it so much that he doesn't have to really make decisions. He's just going to be reactionary. And you don't allow the opposition to get him. If you think about it, in the back three, he's got Asby Loqueta so narrow to him on the right-hand side. He's got Cahill on the left-hand side. So that pocket of area that he's working in as a centre-half is actually very small. But then you add on the big difference is that N'Golo Conte is in front of him screening. So effectively, you can't get balls into centre forward's feet because this is a problem. When David Luiz has to make decisions whether or not to go short or protect the space, he invariably makes the wrong decision time and time again. And this is the frustration. I think, I think there's too many players now at Arsenal where when you set up a team, and certainly Arteta has done that as soon as he's gone there, you want to play to their strengths and protect their weaknesses. And I think at times Arteta has done that. But the problem is, is that there are too many players who have too many weaknesses. And as a collective, it just doesn't work. And I think Arteta's got to really strip it back. I think these last nine games, and certainly the, the games he had prior to the lockdown, gives him a, a, a really big chance to reflect and say, listen, these players, no matter how good a coach you are, they are not going to get Arsenal back to where he hopes they will be. No, and, and Arsenal have to make a decision in the next couple of weeks, Gary, about what happens with David Luiz. Given, as you said, there's not too many ready-made centre-backs that they could purchase around Europe at the moment. Is there any chance they say, right, let's trigger this 12 months? Well, no, listen, in terms of listening to the interview afterwards, where David Luiz will come out and people will say, listen, at least he come out and held his hand up. It was, it was too self-serving, in, in my opinion. That. And I've seen that so many times again, where players who make mistakes and go, sorry, as if that's, that deals with it. I said, sorry. Just don't make the mistakes. Well, don't make the same mistakes. Learn from them. But I think the leadership of certainly Arsenal, in terms of the hierarchy, has got to be better than it has been. Because ultimately, I look at that decision. To pay, if, if they don't, if they don't take that option up, which I don't think they will, listening to those interviews, that's the, that's the argument Louise and Arteta are having. If they don't, effectively, they've paid £8 million for a centre-half. And then on top of that, wages, which would have been top wages, for a centre-half to play for one season, that club is just letting millions drip out of the club on hemorrhaging money. It's incredible. Mm. You look at that and it's investment alone. Maybe you do that for a, for a goal scorer, someone who really affects it, but you certainly wouldn't do it for, for a centre-half who is at this complete other spectrum of what you need in terms of reliability. So I, I, I look at that leadership now at Arsenal in, in terms of what's happening again with Aubameyang, which we've seen over the years. We've seen so many players leave for a fraction of their worth, Ramsey. And you think they would learn, and I think they will learn on the situation that they backed Ozil for the big contract over Ramsey. And that's been a massive mistake because this is the problems you're having. We're not even talking about the issues that you have on the pitch with these players. But with Ozil, it's just another manager now is not even taking him with the squads. Mm -hmm. There's going to have to be a moment when Ozil thinks, well, listen, it can't be it can't be the manager's fault because every manager is, is doing this to me at the moment. And I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Ozil's. I really am in terms of what he can do. But I think when the negatives start to outweigh the positives, which so many of men players is happening at Arsenal, then I think you just have to, I think you just have to bite the bullet. I think it's five years now since they've won away against one of the big six in the Premier League. That's 25 games 
zero yeah. wins. Uh, in commentary last night, Gary Neville said a big cultural shift is required to change that. He's not wrong, Gary. The question is, how do you go about that? So this is a question, if you forget about the finances, forget about what they can't do in the transfer market, how can Mikel Arteta affect a cultural shift at a club? Well, I think he, I think he is doing that. I, I genuinely do think about that. I think initially when he comes in, um, a few players were discarded. Um, what's the young midfielder with the hair of David Luiz? I can't, I can't forget. Gwendouzi. Gwendouzi, of course, yeah. So he plays last night, but initially when he comes in and everyone's saying, well, well Gwendouzi has been a really good signing, he didn't have the, 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 the discipline that he wanted from centre midfield, so he discarded him a little bit, didn't he? He kept him away from the squad. So he's flexed his muscles there, Arteta. And I think he will do. I think he's going to make a decision now that these players, as, as good as they can be on their day, are not consistent enough because you're talking about Arsenal. We're not talking about a, a mid-table Arsenal team, although when you look at them, it does look like that. So I think he will change the culture. I genuinely believe that. I think he's been quite vocal now to say that he will need support in the transfer market. But I don't think he'd be able to compete with the big boys. We know that, of course, they're not going to get in the Champions League. So they're going to have that um, shortfall in money again. They, they might not even make the Europa League, yeah. which is a massive shortfall again. So I think he needs to build that. I think he's talking a lot about this quality in the Arsenal um, youth teams coming through. The very fact he's playing in Ketia all the time suggests that he wants to go with the younger players. We've got Martinelli as well. So I think he's just going to have to go down that route and create a culture that he can really influence. Not with, not with players who are 28, 29, who are, who, who are set in their ways as such, who don't really want to buy into the new manager. Although when you listen to David Luiz last night, he was waxing lyrical about the, the coach, wasn't he, in terms of how good he is. So I, I do think there are positive strides going forward, but I think that squad that he's inherited, like with Emery, is, is, is just not at the level required to play for Arsenal. Yeah, it, it doesn't look good. Just one last question on, on that game, Gary, and this could be potentially as much to do with credit for Manchester City as it is a stick to beat Arsenal with. Just it seemed when Arsenal were trying to play out of the back last night, it was four passes and the ball was back at Bern Leno's feet and they couldn't really get out of uh, their own box at times. It looked terrible. It looked like their entire passing out of the back system had completely broken down. But at the same time, it seemed that there were blue shirts everywhere. I appreciate being watching it on television and not being at the stadium doesn't give us a full picture of how good Manchester City were in terms of pressing. But who is to, to blame or who is to credit there for this sort of breakdown and being unable to get out from the back? Well, I don't think Guardiola's teams and I've said this consistently, you get enough credit for how, mm. how difficult they are to play through. We, 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 we obviously admire their skills to how good they are, but they're so good without the ball. Kevin De Bruyne, again, we talk about how good he is with the ball, but just watch how good he is without in terms of hunting down. But that that's just not about desire. That's not just about closing down. That's organisation. That's mm. coaching. And I think Arteta, I, I felt Arsenal done it well in the first 15 minutes, Arsenal had 50% possession, which is not the norm away to City. Those front three were narrow, encouraged City to go back. So there was a control about them. But the reality is, in terms of trying to play out from the back for Arsenal, the breakdown will always be that you can't play out through Guendouzi. You can't play on the half turn. If you think about his, his skill set, he's, he's running around, he's athletic and stuff like that. But he can't play on the half turn and get you out comfortably. That's why Arteta made a big deal about bringing Xhaka back in when that massive fallout with the crowd, because he knows for all his sins, he can do that. He can play on the half turn. He can play and make passes and break lines. Likewise, Torreira, I'm, a, I'm a, a massive fan of his, but you can't play through him either. And that's the difference. If you look about the, the centre midfielders of City, who at times over the years have been David Silva, De Bruyne, effectively considered wire players initially, but now have come into those central areas. All of their players, whoever plays centre midfield, can play on a half turn. You can literally give them the ball with a player right behind them and know that they're not going to lose that. You can't do that when you are Arsenal midfielders. Mm. Uh, is there anything that stuck out to you from Aston Villa against Sheffield United outside of the obvious complete cock-up on the, the Hawkeye front? Yeah, I think I, I, I noticed, I thought Keenan Davis, uh, centre forward, gave um, John Egan a tough time. Um, I'm a massive fan of John Egan's. Mm. And I, but I do genuinely believe that centre halves take a bit longer to get into their rhythm, your timing and stuff like that. And uh, perhaps that was why David Luiz didn't pick up the, the bounce of the ball particularly well. I, I do think that takes time. Uh -huh. I like the look of him. That looks good for Villa. But I just couldn't catch my breath, Owen, in terms of what happened there. Because when you're watching the game, and you, you can see, clearly see the ball's gone over the line, but as soon as the referee does that, the watch signal, you think, oh, he didn't then. I, I must have been deceived. And for that watch to break down or, and, and not give the right decision on the first game back is staggering because Hawkeye, goal line technology, whatever they call it, 
has been one of the best additions to football. And for it to break down in the first case, it's just incredible. Mm, it really is. It's an interesting point you make about central defenders perhaps being the ones who will look the worst during this comeback yeah. because it's, it's that sharpness. It's not so much fitness. How, how different are those two things in terms of finding that sharpness despite the fact that your cardiovascular fitness is probably still at sky high levels? Yeah, and, and what it is, is um, it's, it's more about picking up the flight of the ball because you do all the work you, you, you want to do and you can do all that, but you never can replicate it in terms of how quickly things are happening around you, the traffic, people running off your shoulder, decision makings and just being able to look at the run, but being able to pick up the flight of the ball perfectly. All those type of things, when you effectively come back for pre-season in terms of your heading, take ages to get back, really, because your timing's all off. When you're going for heading, it ends up hitting you in the eye. Your timing's not quite there. And I think certainly, I, I always remember that, I know the kind of role of a centre-half and the physique of a centre-half has certainly changed over the years. They're not as big as ro and robust as they used to be. They're more mobile. But John is a big guy, and I, I just felt at times that the, Davis was leaning into him, wasn't getting his timing quite right. But in terms of how quick John gets things right, I've no doubt he'd be back to his usual high standard. But wow. having said that, another clean sheet. So impressive, Sheffield tonight. They really are. And I think they will look at that two points that I think if they'd have got that goal, they'd have comfortably gone on to win the game. For sure. And uh, good to see Conor Harahan as well getting the start as well for Aston Villa yeah. in, in that midfield. Uh, just a quick yeah. one ahead of uh, the weekend, Gary. It, it was due to be the weekend that Liverpool were going to win the Premier League. Not going to happen. To be honest with you, I, like after watching that last night, I don't know why people even considered that Goodison Park was going to be where Liverpool were going to win the league if you were depending on Arsenal to do them a favour uh, against Manchester City. Um, but Spurs against Manchester United tomorrow night, Like after watching the, the fitness and the standard of last night, I think it is going to live up to the hype. The, these next few games and these, these big games in particular, Manchester yeah. United, we often talk about them too much, but it genuinely feels that they are one of the more fascinating teams in the Premier League at the moment, given how good their form was before the break, given they possibly have Marcus Rashford and Paul Pogba back in the team. It's, yeah. a, it's a tricky one to figure out, given how good they were before the break. Do you automatically bring a star like Paul Pogba into the starting eleven, for example? Oh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a completely um, new ball game now. Mm -hmm. It's a restart. I think that momentum that you have going into that, that, that that's, that's done and dusted. Forget about that. You've got to build it again. But I think it's exciting for United in terms of everyone coming back from injuries. Likewise, Tottenham, they'll have Kane back, Son's there, uh, Bergwijn as well. So I think United and Spurs have benefited in terms of the players coming back. And I think if you look at United now, and, and under Solskjaer, I was always a bit... I, I never really bought into it. I always felt that it was just something he got the job on the back of his career, his playing career. But certainly in terms of being backed now, they just there really does look like some positive signs there for, for Manchester United. You think about the quality that they have now going forward. Obviously, the midfield has, has added massive quality with the signing, Pogba coming back. Uh, I, I think United will, will be strong. I genuinely do. But likewise, I think Mourinho would have taken this opportunity because they looked like they were dead on their feet going just before the, the lockdown. It looked like everything was going wrong for Tottenham. So it's just give Mourinho an opportunity to regroup get some key players back. So I, I, I genuinely think that's going to be uh, something that game will live up to its billing. Do, do you think this break will have reinvigorated Jose Mourinho? Like he often needs a, a bit of a pre-season to organise things and that's basically yeah. what this was. Yeah, I think, I think that's something you can say to all the managers to be perfectly honest. I mean, because if you think about even Aston Villa and, and I've been down the bottom where you're struggling and, and, and you're just looking for something just to go on a little bit of a run and... And I think to, to break what was happening to them, that they were just losing and conceding so many goals, just gave him an opportunity to step back and say, say Aston Villa, well, listen, why are we doing that? To regroup, reassess, because of, of course, when you're in the mix of it, you don't get that time. You genuinely don't. The games come thick and fast, but that gave them an opportunity to do that. I think they'll take the positives out of a clean sheet, Villa. But certainly Mourinho and all the other managers were able to, to take stock. We talked about Arteta. I think he'll have looked back now in the time that he'll have had to himself where he can say, well, listen, I've been able to see all these players now firsthand. Who is going to come on this journey with me? And I think he's made his decisions. I think a lot of managers will. I think that's the only bonus of, of this long lockdown is that a lot of those managers were able to recharge themselves, not just their players, and just to go again for this last part. Gary, it was also a hugely significant night on the protest front uh, with yeah. the, the taking a knee before a game, a hugely striking image given everything we've seen in world sport yeah. over the last four or five years. Uh, it, afterwards, uh, you were listening to, to Brian Kerr chatting with Nathan and uh, this has been something that we've delved into quite a bit over the last couple of weeks on the show about how people in Irish football 
have experienced racism and obviously Brian Kerr as manager of the Ireland team, he's spoken about it in the past but I'd completely forgotten about this, the fact that he as Republic of Ireland manager was receiving racist letters from anonymous people complaining about the fact that black people were, re were representing Ireland. This would have been at the tail end of your international career, Gary. I'm, I'm not sure if you, if you recall this happening or, or how Brian Kerr and, and his attitudes towards racism uh, kind of uh, affected the team or in a positive way at the time. Um, well, no, I, I, I always enjoy listening to Brian there and it was, it was a great interview as such. But in terms of looking back, I think Brian would, would like he would have done with all these players, would have tried to protect anyone who was being attacked as such. So whether or not he spoke personally to them, but there was, ne there was never any sense of, of, of that. Um, you would hope that the players, if they were experiencing it, that they would be able to comfortably say it to us because this is something that I've been quite... I, 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 I really enjoyed the debate. I've got friends I grew up with. Let's not forget that I... I grew up in Camden Town, which is a massive Irish community, but it's so cosmopolitan on top of that. There's so many different nationalities. So I had a very Irish upbringing as such, but a lot of my friends are from all different cultures and stuff like that. And effectively, racism is about power in my mind. And what Brian is saying there, and, and I agree with him there in terms of why wasn't the, 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 the generation before doing what the likes of Rashford and Sterling are doing now. And I don't know either of them, but I'm so proud of them, which is... Oh, it's not a condescending thing to say, but when they've done what they've done over the last couple of months, weeks, whatever, it just makes you feel so proud. But I think ultimately the reason they're able to do that now is that the, the normal mainstream in terms of how you would talk would be through the TV or give interviews to, to reporters. And effectively, they can, they can interpret that however they want. Now, they can bypass all that with social media. I mean, I'm not on social media, but I see the power of it. And they can give out their thoughts process and that. And that's why when I look at the likes of Sterling, in terms of taking on the British press, which he did, was so it was an incredible thing to do. It was such like it was such a, a um, I was such in, so in awe of him at the time because I've I've heard and since heard that the likes of Sol Campbell will say of my generation. I know Sol kind of well reasonably well so such and, and saying well you know you know, the reason I'm not getting these jobs is because of the colour of my skin that's why Frank Lampard is getting them but but it's not well I don't know but why didn't you say it at the time and I heard a great interview uh, from Terry Connor Mick McCarthy's assistant who was saying it's brilliant now that these black lads are able to climb on our shoulders on our backs of what we've done and I thought that was so poignant because I'm not dismissing that they were fighting the cause, but if no one's listening, how, how hard is it then to fight? Now people are listening because the usual way has been bypassed through the papers, through the media. It's a different media now, isn't it? And these players now have a platform to do that. And, and it's great. I, I, I fully... I, I, I'm fully in support of them. I, I think it's credible what they're doing. And then that was a powerful moment when, the, when all the lads took the knee before the game. That will reverberate around the world. And... I think we're in changing times, mm. finally. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, and even in the context of Marcus Rashford and his personal cause over the last few days as well, perhaps there has been a shift in power at the point you're making about the yeah. media and the, and the yeah, filter yeah. On, yeah. on Sterling, that the power is perhaps more in the players' hands? Yeah, it is. It, is, it, is, um, it really is now, and, and it's, it's amazing what they can potentially do. I mean, Marcus Rashford's... I mean, that, uh, that is amazing what he's done. I mean, to, for, the, for a government to allow children to go hungry is staggering. It, it really is when you just look at it in that context that the government had to listen to a 22-year-old footballer. Now, listen, we all, all we hear a lot about these premier footballers and footballers in general is that they're just party boys, blah, blah, blah. But the vast majority of them are great lads, and certainly those two lads who had mentioned Sterling, Rashford, have done that. I mean, to do that it, it is incredible, but it, as, as incredible it is, it's embarrassing that the government would allow children to go hungry the way they did. Mm. Yeah, it's been uh, quite a week and uh, it'll be interesting to see how the protests continue over the next little while. It just kind of uh, on one final point then, I mean, Brian Kerr touching on the fact that racism was clearly a big thing from the Irish supporters towards the players. Yeah. E even in terms of any of your black teammates in, in the Irish dressing room, was, was that ever anything that they'd spoken about or, or anything that you had experienced firsthand? I'm sure we went to countries, Eastern European countries, I'm not tarring them all with the same brush, but that you would have had the, 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 the kind of racist chance on this and that was, well, how long ago was that? 10th? 
what, 15, 20 years ago. They're still doing it. And, and, and the, the authorities are not really like punishing them from, are they what, like playing behind closed doors and stuff. Ultimately, it is education. It's right what Brian said there. You don't, you're not born a racist. Yeah. You're, you're a product of your environment in terms of who's teaching you what as such. And, but it's amazing, isn't it? Because was anyone, was any Irish supporter like um, writing letters about Paul McGrath, our most iconic player? I mean, I can't, he's idolised, isn't he? I'm sure there are some complete racist idiots who probably did, but I don't know whether or not it was just aimed at Clinton and, and, and Stephen Reid, as, as was mentioned. Obviously, when I first got into the Ireland squad, Curtis Fleming and Curtis spoke so eloquently about his experiences. And I think it's only when you hear just how, how much it hurt those players that you, you do look within and to think like, my God, it's just... Ah. Mm. It, 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 it's shocking. It's just absolutely shocking. 